Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so we are happy to have uh, Yuri, and I always mispronounce your last name, Makarachev? Yeah. Okay. He said yes, I'm sure I mispronounced it. Anyway, <laughs> but we're happy to have Yuri here. Um, many of us know him quite well because he's been an intern here. He was an intern here for a couple of summers. Um, and he is going to be talking about a really interesting topic, approximation algorithms for unique games. Thank you for the introduction. So I will talk about approximation algorithms for unique games. My talk is based on uh, two, two papers. One is a joint paper with Moses Chariker and Konstantin Makarachev. The other is a joint paper with Eden Hlamtich and Konstantin Makarachev. And let me start with the definition of the unique games problem. In the unique games problem, we have a graph G. So <coughs> the, the graph has and vertices, the vertices are represented by this large circle on this picture, and we have k colors. In this example, we have three colors, and colors are represented by these small circles. So here we have orange, blue, and red. Our goal is to color the graph with these colors, and for every edge of the graph, we have a permutation pi uv, which defines a constraint on the colors. So in this example, if this vertex is orange, then this one should be red. If u is red, then v should be blue. And if u is blue, then v should be orange. We have such, we have such constraint permutation for every edge. And our goal is to maximize the number of satisfied constraints. Um, let's try to find the coloring of this graph, say we color the first vertex with blue, and I will denote it uh, like this, so this orange is, uh, this vertex is blue, then this constraint prescribes us to color the second vertex with orange, we color it, and we proceed in this way and get a coloring. So in this example, these black edges are satisfied constraints but the remaining two edges, this one and this one, are not satisfied. For example, here we have that this vertex is orange, but this vertex is not red as it should be. So do you understand this uh, diagram, this uh, idea of large circles and small circles and colors? Pi is per edge. Sorry? Permutation pi is per edge. Uh, yeah, we have a permutation pi for every edge. For different edges, we can have different permutations, of course. And it's easy to see that if all the constraints are satisfiable, we can easily find the optimal solution. Let's just guess the color of the first vertex and then propagate the color along all the edges. But if even a small fraction of all constraints is not satisfiable, the problem becomes very hard. And namely, the Unique games conjecture of Hot states that uh, for every positive epsilon and delta and sufficiently large number of colors k, uh, given a one minus, given an instance of the unique games problem where one is one minus epsilon fraction of all constraints is satisfiable, it is then p hard to satisfy even a delta fraction of all constraints. And this conjecture has recently attracted a lot of attention because it was used to prove a lot of very interesting uh, results, hardness results. So for every edge, we have also a permutation. In this sense, yeah, it's important. It's, it's permutation between the colors of one vertex and the other vertex. But if we like change the direction of the vertex, we can consider the inverse of pi instead of pi. Since the inverse of pi is not equal to pi, it means that you really have to define it on a directed graph. Yeah. And 
this, uh, this table summarizes some of the hardness results. This column shows the results that is used in the game's conjecture. And this column shows the result that, uh, based, that are based on more standard complexity assumptions. Also, this last result actually uses a slightly different version of the Unigames games okay, conjecture. So maybe you can go back to the last slide. Yeah. It's important that we all get the unique games conjecture. So it's, it's hard to di distinguish instances where almost all constraints are satisfiable and instances where only a delta fraction of all constraints are satisfiable for every epsilon and delta and sufficiently large number of colors k that might depend on epsilon and delta. Now the, the conjecture is for all epsilon and delta, so epsilon equals 0.9 and delta 0.9? Uh, yeah, but that's not the hard case. Yeah, the, the hard case. The hard cases are small. When epsilon, epsilon and delta. So, so I give the you. The conjecture is that given k, there exist epsilon and delta small enough such that it's incomplete? So you give me a, a graph <laughs> and ask me whether. I can satisfy 99% of all constraints, or, uh, or I can satisfy 1% of the constraint. And I cannot tell. I, I cannot say that 90, uh, so, so if even 99% if of all constraints are satisfiable, I will not be able to show you a coloring that satisfies 1% of all constraints. What is asking if it's for every epsilon and delta there exists large enough yeah. k, or for? For every epsilon and delta, there exists sufficiently large okay, k. Uh, uh, you phrase it in terms of giving an instance of uh, delta satisfied constraints rather than whether there exists an instance of delta satisfied constraints. But you seem to talk about them interchangeably. Uh, so well, for, ep for every epsilon and delta, and there exists k, and there exists an instance with k colors such that. Yes, but. He's asking you the distinction between an existential proof and a constructive proof, right. right? So he's saying. What's, what's hard, to give an example or to prove? No, to uh, distinguish, to design an algorithm that based on the instance finds an assignment. Right. So there is no such algorithm, right. polynomial time algorithm. Yeah. One more so this is only k, the number of colors? k is the number, is so the number it, of colors. So it's not dependent on the number of nodes or edges? Yeah, so in the conjecture. Yeah. Have two nodes in one edge. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The definition of MP hard involves the M. Ah, oh, okay, okay. But after the K, there's a quantifier in all graphs. Sorry? After the, there, there exists large enough K, there, then there's a quantifier for all graphs. Oh, I see, see. Sorry, sorry. There is no algorithm that works for all N. So if you represent me an algorithm, that its running time depends exponentially on N, assuming that P is not equal to NP. So it's a promise problem. I, I promise you that it's 1 minus epsilon satisfied, yeah. but then the problem is find yeah. a little bit of it. Right. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? No, well, but it's really important that we get this. Wait, wait, wait. Answer. But it's possible to find the delta fraction? That's the point, right? Is so that's that it's not, not possible. it's not possible to find a delta, even a delta fraction. So it's NP hard, you yes or no? It's NP complete, he say yes or no. NP hard is... Uh, it's NP hard to distinguish with it. He's trying to find the instance. You, he could alternatively say, does uh, not find it, but does there exist one? And then it would be... Oh, you're you, you can state it as, as follows. So right you give... You are given an instance, and you know that either this holds that 1 minus epsilon fraction is satisfiable, or at most delta is satisfiable, and you should decide which of these two cases holds. Now, wait a minute. But deciding which holds is not the same as giving an instance where one of them holds. No, but if you're trying to construct the instance, and you, and you don't know which you're headed towards. If you're trying to construct it, but maybe you're just trying to decide which is true. 
Yeah. In most cases, cases, you know, you can know, only solve one. Yeah, no. But the, 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 the conjecture is that it's a happy house that is usually between the two divided. Yeah. In particular, it's a happy house that find an assignment. Yeah. No, it's not so. The conjecture is about the more. Guys, let's try to let's have one conversation. Those are our slightly different versions of the conjecture. Yeah. Good. I'm sorry, I still don't understand. So when you, add, you know you are wrong. Can I try just to say too. a bit differently, maybe? Yes. Okay. So the difficulty is in finding an algorithm, and the algorithm gets an input with no guarantees at all. But it has to have the following property: if it happens by chance that this graph has a very good coloring, in which the one minus epsilon fraction of the edges are colored properly, then this algorithm should say yes, for sure. A yes means it should output. A, a coloring with at least, let's say, a small fraction of the edges It doesn't have to output, but the algorithm fact, claims it be, it, they exist, it's, right? It's, it's, yeah, but it's, it turns it out if they exist. When it claims that they exist, it must be right. Yeah. You cannot <laughs> say that they exist and they would not exist. So one option would be to output the coloring, maybe another sort of proof for itself. It has to be absolutely sure that there exists a coloring with at least a delta fraction of the edges colored correctly. If the input is not of this form, like uh, it doesn't have such a very good coloring, then the algorithm can do kind of doesn't can do whatever it wants. No, I don't understand. You say if there exists a one minus epsilon color, the algorithm has to be sure there exists a delta. At least a delta. delta. At least a delta. It has to be sure that it has a delta. But if there doesn't, then if the algorithm can be non sure. If it doesn't, then uh, the algorithm cannot output something that is wrong, but it can say, for example, I don't know of a delta coloring. I don't know if there is a delta coloring. That's a legitimate so, answer. In so the can I see it like that? The algorithm has to output three answers, either yes, no, or I don't know. Yes. And but on the one and the step, yes, he claims sort of there exists delta. And I don't but, know, he claims nothing. So whenever it says yes, it means that there exists a delta coloring. And it must say yes on some cases. When there's a, a one minus epsilon coloring, it must say yes. It's not allowed to say I don't know on this case. Right. On other okay. cases, it is allowed to say. That's, that's, that I think oh, But that's the definition. It can, it can also always say yes. So that's like. Yeah. No, it's not no, allowed to it's give a wrong answer. To ever the give algorithm wrong never answer. gives a wrong answer. It can okay. say I don't know, but it cannot right. give a wrong answer. And sometimes it must answer yes. Right, so the important point is on that one minus epsilon fraction, it must say yes. I mean, that's. And those which are very, have a very good right. coloring, it must say yes. One minus epsilon or more. Uh, sorry, and the, one, and the ones that have one minus epsilon or more coloring, it must say yes, and that's hard. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> uh, We're okay. okay. So this table summarizes <laughs> some of the known hardness results. This column shows the hardness result assuming the unigames conjecture, and this uh, column shows the hardness result that don't assume the unigames conjecture. And for some problems like max cut and vertex cover, the hardness result that assumes the unigames conjecture actually matches the algorithmic bounds. So if the unigames conjecture is true, then the known approximation algorithms for max cut and vertex cover are, are optimal. For some problems like mean to CNF deletion, multi cut, Parsed cut and uh, coloring three colorable graphs. There is a super constant uh, bound assuming the unigames conjecture, but there is only a constant bound uh, which doesn't rely on the unigames conjecture. And for the multi cut and sparse cut, there is no even any uh, hardness result which is not based on the unigames conjecture. For the Version, or the I think in neither of the versions. What, what was your question? There are two uh, versions of this I, I think there is no hardness result at all. Yeah. Uh, no, no which, which is not based on the Unigames conjecture. Assuming the Unigames conjecture, there is a super constant. But also for the Unicorn version? Uh, for, for both versions for the uniform and non-uniform version. And I think it's log log n. Is any of these tight? So this one is tight and this is tight. Because this is just 
is equal to the uh, Gomez and Williamson, yeah, and this is just trivial uh, algorithm. So we see that uh, assuming the Unigain's conjecture, we can get much better um, hardness results. And this is one of the motivation to study approximation algorithm for Unigain's. And in fact, one of our approximation results disproved some stronger version of the Unigames conjecture that we are considered prior to our work. Another motivation comes fr from the fact that the Unigames problem is a generalization of many other interesting problems. For example, one of the problems is max to lean. Here we have a system of linear equations over a finite field. And uh, each equation uh, has exactly two variables. Of course, if all the equations are consistent, then we can easily solve the system. But assume that a small fraction of all uh, equations is not uh, satisfiable, then the problem is very hard. And this is an instance of the unique games problem. And here, variables correspond to vertices, equations correspond to edges and values from 0 to k minus 1 correspond to colors. And for example, if you look at the first uh, equation, then if you know the value of x1, then we can uh, determine the value of x4, assuming that this equation holds. So we have a unique, uh, so we have a permutation between the values of x1 and x4. So this is a unique games problem. And there is a very special case uh, where k is equal to 2, we have only two colors, then this problem is just the max cut problem. Wait, but couldn't it be that there is several solutions on k? I mean, what if you have k times x4? Uh, we, we, so each of them, if, so, so if we have k or 0, then actually it's a constraint only on one variable. And actually but we can deal with it. Solution. I mean, assume k is even and x. No. We assume that k is prime, so it's a field. Yeah, if k is, is, is not prime, then it's a, not a unique game. And actually, this problem was independently studied, and it's interesting on its own. Uh, let me. Uh, say about non-approximation algorithms. So let's assume that a 1 minus epsilon fraction of all constraints is satisfiable. And first of all, there is a trivial approximation algorithm, the random assignment. So let's assign a, a, a random color to each vertex. And we make this assignment independently. Then the probability that a particular constraint is satisfied is equal to 1 over k. Therefore, the expected fraction of all uh, of satisfied constraints is 1 over k. In 2001, Anderson, uh, Ingebetsen, and Hastert uh, presented an approximation algorithm that has a slightly better approximation guarantee, but it works only for a special case of linear equations. In 2002, uh, Hort presented an approximation algorithm based on semi-definite programming that satisfies this fraction of all constraints. In 2005, uh, Trevisan presented an approximation algorithm that satisfies this fraction of all constraints. And in 2005, Gupta and Talvar presented an approximation algorithm which is based on linear programming that satisfies this fraction of all constraints. But the n goes to large number, then they are becoming negative. Yeah, for large, if epsilon is large, then this approximation algorithms give uh, trivial approximation so guarantees. If epsilon, if n is large. Yeah, if n is large, then yeah, the, the approximation algorithm doesn't guarantee anything. So the point to say here is that epsilon may depend on n. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, 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 right. Epsilon, k, now we think that epsilon, k, and uh, so, so we consider this for arbitrary epsilon, k, and then they may depend on each other. Cases where you apply the unique games conjecture to prove Hardness results, that you take epsilon to be a constant or to be something that tends. Uh, in, in, in the standard, it's constant. 
yeah, in more, more strong uh, versions of the Unigames conjecture that were considered sometimes epsilon was equal to 1 over log n or 1 over log k. And in most uh, reductions, k is equal to log n. So in, in most results that use the Unigames uh, conjecture to prove other Hadamish results, k is equal to log n. What I'm asking is about if these algorithms deal with cases of the unique games that are interesting. Yeah, I mean, we don't know how to disprove the unique games conjecture, so they don't give any uh, guarantee at all. And what we do, we present three approximation algorithms. Each of them is better than the others in so on range of epsilon. The first one satisfies k to the power of minus epsilon over two minus epsilon a fraction of all constraints. The second one satisfies one minus big O square root epsilon log k fraction of all constraints. And the third one satisfies one minus big O epsilon square root log n uh, log k fraction of all constraints. And these two were developed in a joint paper with uh, Chariker and Konstantin Makarichev. And this one was developed in a joint paper with Klantich and Konstantin Makarichev. So let me uh, tell more about these guarantees. The, 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 the yeah, I, I will. I will. I will now explain, compare them for different epsilons. So if epsilon is greater than a constant over log k, then the best approximation algorithm is this one with this approximation guarantee. It's it's larger than these two numbers, and actually these two may be negative, so they don't give any guarantee at, approximation guarantee at all. And for this range of epsilons, the previously best known approximation algorithm was just the random assignment, and our approximation algorithm performs better even if epsilon is very close to 1. So for this range of epsilons, there were no uh, known results, non-trivial results before. Uh, now, if absence is between some constant over log n and a constant over log k, then our second algorithm performs better, and it gives this approximation guarantee. And uh, prior to our work, the best approximation guarantee was uh, in this algorithm by Hot. So here we have, in a sense, exponential improvement. And in the <coughs> uh, third algorithm, we satisfy this number of constraints and Prior to our rework, uh, this, uh, the, Gupta, the algorithm of Gupta and Talvar satisfies this fraction of all constraints. And this is better. So usually k is equal to log n in complexity reduction. So this is like square root log n, log log n. And also, a Hot Kindler model on O'Donnell proved that if you improve these approximation guarantees, so in fact, if you make the constant here in this O notation and here constant small, then you will disprove the unique games conjecture. So this approximation algorithm are optimal assuming the unique games conjecture in a sense. So if you improve a constant here or a constant here, then you will disprove the unique games conjecture. So this algorithm, this and this are optimal assuming the unique games conjecture. It was proved by Hot, Kindler, Mosel, and O'Donnell. And in this talk, I will mostly describe this algorithm, the second algorithm, but uh, I will use the framework which we developed for the third algorithm, and in the end of the talk, I will talk a little bit about this third result. I, it's also interesting to compare uh, known results for MaxCut and the unique games. So recall that MaxCut is just a very special case of the unique games problem where we have only two colors. There are approximation algorithm based on linear programming, and the algorithm of Garg, Vizirani, and Yunakakis satisfies 1 minus big O epsilon log n fraction of all constraints. The algorithm of Gupta and Talvar for unique games satisfies 1 minus big O epsilon log n fraction of all constraints. Now, if epsilon is greater than a constant over log n, then the algorithm of Gomans and Williamson uh, based on semi-definite programming satisfies 1 minus big O square root epsilon fraction of all constraints. And we present an approximation algorithm that satisfies this many constraints. 
if epsilon is less than constant of log n, then the approximation algorithm of Agarwal, Chirikar, Chirikar, Constantin, Makarchev, and myself satisfies one minus big O epsilon square root log n fraction, algorithm, uh, fraction of all constraints, and V uh, satisfies this fraction of all constraints. So we see that in a certain sense, these results match these results if k is a fixed number. And this shows that in a sense there is no difference between instances of unigames with two colors and with a fixed large number of colors. And prior to our work, there were no, no match and approximation guarantees even for k equal to three. So the case equal, is equal to two is very different from the case when k is greater than two in the design of the, the algorithms. Um, so I described uh, the problem and known results. Do you have any questions about this introductory part? OK. I see. OK. Let, let me now describe the algorithm. At first, I describe a general idea, the general framework. We find the partial coloring. So our goal is to find the coloring of the graph. And what we do is we find the partial coloring and then find the partial coloring of the remaining graph and iterate. And I will describe this general framework at first, but I will not say how, in a sense, we find this general coloring. And uh, then I will uh, describe the semi-definite relaxation and analyze a special uniform case. And here, I will describe how we actually find the partial coloring. And finally, so uh, I will switch to the third approximation result, and I will describe a new class of low distortion metric space embeddings that we need, which we call orthogonal separators. So let me start with partial colorings. So recall that we have a graph G. We want to color it with K colors. What we do is we color some vertices with vertices. And we want to color a constant fraction of all vertices, but we want to violate as few constraints as possible. When do we violate a constraint? Either if we color both its endpoints, and this, uh, this colors, um, the permutation between these two vertices is not satisfied, or we color only one of the vertices and don't color the other, and then we cannot actually ensure that we will satisfy this constraint in the future. So we conservatively assume that the constraint is violated. Uh, so then we look at the remaining graph and iteratively color it. So now, how do we find this partial coloring? The idea is to uh, choose a set of colors SU for every vertex U. And I will describe how we actually find the set SU later when I will talk about some definite programming. This set SU may contain exactly one color, like here. It may contain two colors, like here. Or it may be an empty set. Or it may contain more colors. If the set SU contains exactly one color, then we color the vertex with this color. However, if the set contains uh, more than one color or no colors, we don't color the vertex. So we get a partial coloring. So recall that we want to color a constant fraction of all vertices. And this means that we want uh, to ensure that the set SU contains exactly one color with constant probability. Now let's look at a particular constraint, particular HGV. And when we analyze this HGV, we, we may assume that the permutation between U and V is just the identity permutation. Uh, what, what happens when SU is equal to SV? First, it may be the case that uh, the set SU consists of exactly one color. Then, of course, set SV, which is equal to SU, also consists of the same color. So we color U and V with this color, in this case, blue color. And th the constraint between U and V is satisfied. This is the good case. It may be the case that SU consists of more than one color, 
then of course SV also consists of more than one color, and there are four. We don't color U and we don't color V. And this is a neutral case because we may color uh, U and V, we, we will color U and V in the future, and we, we may satisfy the constraint in the future. But it may be also the case that sets SU and SV are not equal. And for example, in this case, when uh, SU it consists of one color and SV consists of uh, the other color, the constraint is not satisfied. In general, it may be the case that uh, SU uh, contains two colors, SV contains two colors, so we don't color U, we don't color V, and the constraint uh, will be assigned in the future. But we conservatively assume that the constraint is not satisfied if sets SU and SV are not equal. Uh, so this diagram summarizes what we know. At, at first of an iteration, uh, colors of U and V are not assigned. Now we pick set, set SU and SV <coughs> if they are equal and uh, set SU consists of one element, then the constraint is satisfied. <coughs> if they are equal but set SU doesn't have any ele elements or ha has more than one element, then again, colors of U and V are not assigned. And finally, there is a bad case when sets SU and SV are not equal, and then we conservatively assume that the constraint is not satisfied. And we want to ensure that this bad case happens with small probability, big O of square root epsilon log k. So we, we think that this number is small. And this, this event that uh, size of SU is 1 happens with some constant probability. And if we ensure that this condition holds, then uh, the expected, um, the, uh, the probability that the constraint is not satisfied will be this probability, just because it's, in a sense, a, a Markov chain. So is this uh, approach clear? OK. N now let me describe the semi-definite relaxation. Let's start with the integer program. For every vertex u and every color i, we introduce an indicator variable ui. For example, in this, here we introduce indicator variables u1, u2, and u3. For the vertex v, we introduce indicator variables v1, v2, and v3. Say if the first vertex is blue and the second is orange, then u1 is equal to 1 and v2 is equal to 1. But all the remaining variables are equal to 0. And if the constraint between u and v is satisfied, then we have that ui is equal to the corresponding v. Or in other words, this expression is equal to 0 just because every term here is equal to 0. Because we will be able to then relax this. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Now, if the constraint is not satisfied, then this expression is equal to 1, because exactly two, uh, two, two terms here are equal to 1. One term which contains uh, u1 and the term that contains v3 in this example. So we get an integer program. Our, our objective function is to minimize this expression, to minimize the number of unsatisfied constraints. We require that ui is either 0 and 1. And we also require that we color each vertex with exactly one color. And we require it by having these two equations. Can you go back? So this, this thing can never be 2? Yeah, yeah, because. He, he, he had a half area. It was two in this example. Well, sure. I mean, it can never be. We have half here to get one here. And we assume that only u, one of these variables u is equal to one, and only one of variables v is equal to one. Okay. So if they can, like, if this one and this one, then we have zero. And otherwise, if this one and this zero, then <laughs> this is equal to, this, this contributes one to this sum. Is this clear? So we get this integer program, 
and it is exactly equivalent to the original problem. So we cannot also solve this uh, problem in polynomial time. What we do now, we consider it semi-definite relaxation. So we replace every 0, 1 variables, variable with a vector in a, a high dimensional space. And you, you have a lot of time because you started late mm -hmm. and we harassed you. So <laughs> OK. Uh, so now every UI is a vector in a high dimensional space or in Hilbert space if you prefer. And uh, we have these constraints. We also have some uh, technical constraints, these uh, triangle like waltzes, but I will not talk about them. What is important is uh, this condition that uh, vectors corresponding to one vertex u are orthogonal. So all vectors u1, etc., uk are orthogonal. Uh, the last constraint, if you think of them as R P or so, I mean, they're this automatic, one. right? Yeah, they're, if they're so just zero, one. How do you find a norm for us yet? Yeah, uh, so. If this norm is a norm, this is just a triangle inequality, so I don't understand. No, this no, is no, not no. a triangle. If you don't have squares here, it's just a triangle in oh, okay. But we have uh, squares here. I see. And it, this actually means that all the angles in our configuration of vectors are at most 90 degrees. Uh, and in a sense, you may think of, of ui as the probability that we assign, so this ui squared uh, is the probability that we assign color i to the vertex u. And this, then this condition says that the total probability that we assign uh, a color is equal to 1. This is similar to what happens in quantum mechanics. We also have squares of vectors. OK. Now, we so. For probabilities. For probability. And here, it's also the probability. Right, right. And now, so we solve this semi definite program get vectors ui for every vertex u, uh, they are orthogonal for each individual vertex. And so first, we will recall that we want to pick a set SU for every vertex U. So in other words, we want to pick a, a set of vectors for every vertex U. And we want to, for vertices U and V, we, we want to uh, pick sets SU and SU that are equal. And this means that we don't want to uh, separate close vectors. So if two vectors are close, we want to either pick both of them or don't pick either of them. Why are there some uh, colors that aren't given vectors here? Why, Why are there some colors in your diagram that aren't given vectors? Uh, just zero vector. Zero? Yeah. Why they all to be norm one? So oh, the sum each is vector, oh, right. we okay. don't know that, uh, okay. so, so we can't have zero vectors. But the sum of ui squares is equal to 1. Oh, so those, those aren't unit vectors. They're, they're vectors. Those vectors you right. see aren't unit okay. vectors. Okay. They're adding right. up yes. to 1. Yes. Yeah. Right. And the other condition is that we want to have that the set SU contains exactly one vertex with high, uh, one color with high probability. And this means that we want to pick exactly one vertex among orthogonal vectors this high probability, because vectors corresponding to one vertex are orthogonal. So this is the idea. And now I'll describe the analysis in a special case, the uniform case. So let's assume that in the optimal solution, we can satisfy, so not we, but a 1 minus epsilon fraction of all constraints is satisfiable. And uh, in this uniform, in a sense, we will analyze the lengths of vectors and their directions separately. And in the uniform case, let's assume that all vectors have the same length. So now, now all vectors have uh, the length 1 over square root of k. And in fact, in some. So that's kind of like the random assignment of the color, or not? It's, yeah, right. And in, in a sense, uh, we can ensure this in some instances of unique games, actually where all colors 
uh, are equal in a sense, where we have uh, so some group of permutation acting uh, transitively on all the colors, and we which commute with the permutations. So it, this actually happens sometimes. And in this case, uh, let u tilde ui be uh, squ square root k times ui, so it's a, a unit vector with the same direction as ui. Now let's pick a random Gaussian vector, g. Each component of g is um, a standard Gaussian vector, and different components are independent. Let's project g onto this vector tilde ui. So let c ui be this projection. And si since g is the Gaussian vector, each projection is a Gaussian random variable with standard deviation 1. And also since vectors ui are orthogonal, C vectors c ui for different i's and fixed u are independent. Now, now let s u be let, let us you consist of those colors for which C ui is greater than some fixed threshold t. And this is the same set as u which we uh, saw before. So it's, this is the set of colors. And we pick this threshold so that this probability that C ui is greater than t is equal to 1 over k. And we can do it because just the distribution of C ui is the standard normal distribution. So it's just a quantile. So each u belongs to SU with probability 1 over k, so the expected size of SU is 1. And this is, recall, that we want to ensure that uh, the set SU contains exactly one vertex with high probability. Now let's uh, look what we want. So we want to ensure that this event that SU uh, the size of SU is 1 has a constant probability, and this bad event that SU is not equal to SV has small probability. Let's I verify. Want yeah? I want to make sure that I understand what's going on here. So is it that you, you use some subroutine to calculate the solution to the relaxed problem, and now you use the output of that subroutine to find an approximate solution for the original problem? So so I use some different programming to generate sets S, U, and S, V, all the sets S. And then I use the sets uh, in the framework that I described before. So if set S, U can, uh, consists of exactly one color, then we color the vertex with this color, and then proceed recursively on the remaining graph. OK, but did you use some, some Subroutine that solves the relaxed problem. Oh, semi-definite semi program. Semi-definite program. Yeah, we can solve the semi-definite program in polynomial time almost exactly. Yeah, I, I don't describe how we solve the semi-definite program. It's, for example, we can use the ellipsoid method. Okay, so we want. Uh, uh, to check these two conditions. Let's start with the first one. So the probability that i belongs to SU is equal to 1 over k. The event that 1 belongs to SU, etc., k belongs to SU are independent. Therefore, the probability that SU, the size of SU is equal to 1 is some constants, roughly 1 over e. And we are done with the, with the first condition. Now let's verify the other condition first. Let's compute the probability that uh, i belongs to SU, but i doesn't belong to SV. And this means that the projection of uh, the Gaussian onto tilde ui is greater than this threshold t, but the projection of g onto v tilde vi is less than this threshold t. And we can actually estimate this probability, and we get this expression. And here we get this uh, term. Uh, Why is 1k coming in there? Uh, so this, this, this number is actually the density of the Gaussian distri distribution at point t. So the probability uh, that the Gaussian is larger than t is 1 over k, just be because of our choice of uh, t. And here we have this 
uh, term if you want to compute the density. <coughs> and this comes because of the dif distance between yeah. tilde ui and tilde vi, yeah. and this makes sense. Yeah. And then we rewrite it, this expression in terms of ui and vi. Sorry, what do you mean by like separated? ui and vi are separated. S so this means that uh, I belong to SU and V, okay. uh, I, I doesn't belong to SV, or this projection uh, one, is one is larger one than T and the other is less than T, or the other way, way around. Okay, so this is, isn't determined by the values of, of the, the vectors, it is also depends on the random choices. Uh, so we want to compute the probability if you fix vectors UI and VI, uh, and the d distribution of G is is but fixed. It's just we'll, yeah, it's a yes. random event depending on yeah. the yeah. And you want to compute this probability, yeah. And when you say I and S U and I not in S V, you mean I not in pi of S V? Yeah, right. Here they again assume for simplicity that the permutation is the identity. Right. But many times already in the talk you've said yeah. it, it, you you kind of dropped the pi so you yeah. can implicitly assume it. So identity. here it's so that you of you belongs to each pair, but you can't do jointly for seven pairs. No. Uh, no, but it I, I can I can use a, a union bound. Uh, so now I can sum up this expression over uh, different <coughs> all values of i and use the convexity of the square root function, and you get this upper bound. So the probability that at least one of these events happens is at most this. And now, so the probability that the constraint is not satisfied is at most this probability. And now we call that in the objective function, this is our objective function, so the average value of this expression is epsilon. And we replace this by epsilon and we get that uh, again, we use a convexity argument, uh, and we use we get that the expected fraction of unsatisfied constraints is square root epsilon log k. And using methods like this, you wouldn't expect to get any better than that because that log k came from the density of the Gaussian. And right. You really needed a Gaussian vector to ensure independence. Right. Of the of a component. Yes. So th th I mean nothing. Right? I mean, it's not like, oh, you could have chosen some better vector out there. Um, yeah. Because then you wouldn't have had independence of the components. And, yeah. Isn't it enough if you have pairwise independence here? Oh, that's good. Uh, but for all directions. For what? It, well, mm -hmm. you just used pairwise independence. Didn't right. You, you uh, uh, maybe you could. It's not just the coordinate direction. No, there was one step where you used independence. We got the one over e. That one over e. That's a well, but since the expectation is one, yeah. uh, you're pretty safe there anyway. No, uh, actually, unless yeah. you get zero. Uh, yeah, I think that we need independence complete, and at least yeah, I think we use the complete independence. Right, but this is what he's saying. I was saying you couldn't do better, and what Oded was pointing out is that you were not using. Yeah. Joint independence, you were using pairwise independence. But you're saying you're using joint. Yeah, especially. So, so first of all, this is the basic case where uh, all, all lengths are equal. The, the other part where different vectors may have different lengths is more complicated. And actually, he, there we use, uh, we use a lot of different facts. Yeah. Actually, we even, in a sense, have that UI is in VI in a sense. Uh, so, so we actually use that all of them are independent, yeah. It, it's, it's more complex. So for this case, you could do this pair as independent. Exactly. Um. Uh, I'm not sure if that would allow you to pick a nicer. Yeah, I, I don't know. Better density. It's sufficient. Mm. Of whom? I mean, I don't understand. I mean, the independence is between the different coordinates of the of G, not between the two vectors. Uh, we use independence. 
we use that U, U, UIs are orthogonal for, for a fixed vertex U. Therefore, this uh, CUIs are independent. And of course, since they are Gaussian, in, uh, variables, if two of them are independent, then every two of them are independent, then all of them are independent. Can you explain the role of this extra inequality, which you said you won't explain? Uh, triangle inequality. <laughs> OK. So far, we, I guess, didn't use it. So I will try. Just a hint. Oh, uh, yeah. So. Let's look at the non-uniform case, and here I will explain why we need it in this algorithm, but actually we need it much more in the following algorithm. So here, if different vectors UI have different lengths, then we anyway need to normalize them. And the reason for that, because if one vector is even uh, a little bit longer than the other, then the probability that we pick the longer vector is much higher. Because we, we, we are considering like a threshold t, which is very large, and t times some constant. And the probability that a Gaussian is larger than t, and the probability that t is larger, say, that 1.1t, are very different because t is very large, and tails of the Gaussian distribution decrease very fast. So we actually need to, uh, to consider normalized factors. But on the other hand, to correctly estimate the contribution of every vector to the HDP, we want to pick, uh, to assign color i to the vertex u with probability proportional to the squared Euclidean length of ui. So what we do, we consider many projections, and the number of projections corresponding to vector ui is proportional to the squared Euclidean length of ui. And in a sense, then, we use the same analysis as I described. But here, what can happen is that the number of projections for one vector, and the like for vector ui and the corresponding vector of vi, is different. And this is bad, because if we pick a projection for vi, which is not matched by a projection of ui, then the constraint will be uh, unsatisfied. So we need to ensure that the number of projections is approximately the same. And here, we use triangle inequalities. So we can always, uh, using triangle inequalities, claim that this num the number of projections for ui and vi is roughly the same. So this is briefly what we do in the non-uniform case, but the complete analysis is, is more complex, so I will describe it. So uh, what we did, we show that if the optimum is equal to 1 minus epsilon, then we can satisfy 1 minus big O square root epsilon locate fraction of all constraints. So do you have uh, questions about here? Yeah. So you just showed there exists a solution. You didn't actually have an algorithm that constructed it. It's a random algorithm. Right? It's a randomized algorithm, right. So you de-randomize it afterwards? No, it's a randomized algorithm. So you don't know, in fact, that you don't have an algorithm that produces I, I a randomized yeah, algorithm. Randomized algorithm. Yeah, in, I think we can de-randomize it, but yeah, I, uh, we didn't think about it. So I guess in our areas, all algorithms are randomized algorithms. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, how much time do I have? Oh, Uh, how much time do you need? Uh, 15 minutes? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's okay, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Maybe even less. Yeah. Do you have any other questions about this? They, they, they seem to be having a question now. Yeah. If you take ui tilde and you multiply it by some very mildly monotone function of epsilon, so as you said, using the original uis, ones with a longer length have much too big an advantage. Yeah. But you could scale, I mean, take UI tilt, but then, you know, when UI is, is big, you scale it by some very slowly increasing function yeah. of UI programmed so that you get this UI so squared effect that you want. So actually, we have an approximation algorithm like that for the first result. 
k to the power of minus epsilon over 2, but probably with the uh, worst, worst con constants and with more complicated analysis. But we don't know how to do the same. Uh, this uh, thing that you told in the sec for the second and the third case. Yeah, so, so, so in general this works here, yeah, and in the, in the first case we know how to do it. But here the main complication arises because we have many, uh, we, we can have, I mean, yeah, it's, it's not clear. To what? The slide with the meta algorithm. With the, with the um, tree that you did. Yeah. Yeah. So now you iterate. We iterate this here, and each with, a, with a, almost always we go here, and then with a constant probability we go here, and with a very small probability we go the, here, and then we stop. We don't uh, satisfy this constraint. So once you are there, you just stop. You don't try anything. In a sense, I mean, we no, we don't stop, but we give up this uh, constraint. This is not so one of the ones that. He for each case. We, we simultaneously do it for all uh, all the constraints, and this sets as you are the same for all the, uh, I mean, for, for many constraints, because uh, each vertex participates in many constraints. So any, any questions about uh, this? Okay, thank you. So what we want now is to get this result. So the first question, why did we get square root epsilon here? And here epsilon is outside of the square root, ep, uh, square root function, but instead we have the square root log n penalty. So why did we get the square root epsilon here? Because the probability of separating two vectors u and v is proportional to the length between them, which is square root epsilon. And why is it? square root epsilon just because in the semi-definite program, roughly speaking, this contribution is equal to epsilon. Therefore, the, the distance between ui and vi is equal to square root epsilon. So what we want to do, we want to get rid of this square here. But if we just write this program, it will be no longer a semi-definite program, so we will not be able to solve it. What we do instead, we embed the vectors into L2. So what does it mean? So we have our set of vectors x in, in Euclidean space, and we embed them uh, uh, in such a way that the, the distance between images, and here we have just the, the standard Euclidean distance between images, is roughly equal to the squared Euclidean uh, <coughs> distance between the original vectors. More precisely, the distance between the images lies between the distance between vectors u and v, squared Euclidean distance between vectors u and v, and the squared Euclidean distance times this distortion factor d. And um, Aurora, Lee, and Naur show that uh, there exists such embedding where d is equal to square root log n, log log n. So we can apply this embedding to our problem and then we get rid of the square. But unfortunately, so we, we need to ensure these two constraints. But n now they no longer hold. And these constraints are very crucial to our algorithm. So, so if they, are not, they don't hold, then we cannot do anything. And in particular, if two vectors ui and uj are orthogonal initially, then after we embed them, they may be even collinear. So this, this is a good low distortion embedding, but the vectors are collinear in the image. And then our algorithm fails completely. So what we do, we construct a new, uh, we, we introduce a new class of uh, low distortion embeddings, which we call orthogonal separators. And the main property is the following, that if two vectors u and v are orthogonal, then the probability that you, so we generate a random, this random set S, that the probability that both U and V belong to S is very small. 
So it, it's at most one over k times the minimum of the probability that u belongs to s and v belongs to s. And then we have this uh, condition for simplicity, for simplicity, I think that alpha is just equal to 1. And then this means that the probability that a vector belongs to S is, is equal to the uh, squared Euclidean length of the vector, which is what we want. And finally, the probability of separating two vectors u and v is small. So yeah? I'm confused. What are you quantifying u over? Uh, so you, vectors u belong to some set of vectors, fixed uh, oh, Fixed set X, yeah. Okay. Fixed finite. Finite set, yeah. Where is this set coming from? So this is all the vectors in our mm, SDP solution. It's all what he's going to want to embed when you. Yes. So this is this set X of size n, and in uh, in our case, it's all the vectors that we get from this semi-definite solution. Uh, so the probability of separating two vectors is small. It is at most this distortion factor square root log n log k over the distance between u, squared Euclidean distance between u and v. So how do you do that? And here is the idea how we do it. So I will outline the entire algorithm. We solve this indefinite program, get these vectors. Now we need to normalize them. So recall that... Um, in the analysis of the non-uniform case, we just scaled all vectors. Here we cannot do it anymore because then we will violate this um, triangle inequalities here. So we embed them into space or function on the uh, real line with squared Euclidean uh, norm, and these functions are to Euclidean space. We normalize the vectors. Now we apply a low distortion embedding of these functions into L2. And here we, we may either use the algorithm of Aurora Lee and Naor of uh, Chalo, Gupta, and Raki. And actually we use Gaul, uh, Chalo, Gupta, and Raki to get rid of this extra log log n factor. And it's a little bit uh, surprising that we use L2 here. And it's important for us to use L2 because usually such algorithm embed L2 squared into L1. But in our case, it's better to embed vectors into L2. We can also embed them into L1, L1 but then we will get a slightly worse approximation okay. guarantee. And I thought you were going to do this, um, uh, this orthogonal separator. Right, we will so use it. So, so, so this is already a part of this orthogonal separators from this step, the normalization step. Okay. We use it in the... Okay. to do orthogonal separators so to find. The Chavish Gupta rack, I think, to say this log-log term? Log-log, yeah. But originally the approximation ratio was worse than the uh, was worse So we need, we need, we don't need actually low distortion embedding for all scales. We need a low distortion only for one scale. And it was implicitly in Chalo, Gupta, and Rack, and ex explicitly in the ALN. Then we apply this Gaussian step, find the subset S. Now we need to take into the account uh, length, original length of the vectors. So this corresponds to uh, removing some short vectors randomly, and we get a partial coloring. And then we iterate again, uh, consider these projections, and uh, iterate this procedure. Thank you. So if a vector is short, we, we need to take into the account that it is short. So in this corresponds to the fact that we need to remove short vectors with some probability. Otherwise, we will incorrectly uh, take into the account the objective function. Yeah. Put all of this together, do you get a time which runs in n to some large constant, or yeah. do you get a time runs in n to some large constant depending on epsilon delta? No, no, the running time doesn't depend on epsilon and delta. So it's just n to the 
Uh, so actually, so we use this SDP solver as a block black box, and the, the longest time, I mean, I, I guess the time is mostly determined by the running time of the SDP solver. The processing time then is smaller than the running time of the solver. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's also not clear whether it's true in the original form or in a weaker form. For example, it might be the case that there is a sub-exponential algorithm for uh, the unique games problem, like for the unique games conjecture. But in the original form, the unique games conjecture says that it is NP-hard to d t distinguish these two cases. But maybe it's not uh, NP-hard, but it can be done in, uh, it cannot be done in polynomial time. Uh, for example, it might be the case that if we consider many rounds of, say, lower Shriver hierarchy or some different lift and project procedure, we will get a better approximation for unique games. It's, it's, it's not clear. So you put it the same class as factory. Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> you put it the same class as factory. Factory. Mm. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I, I don't think there is any. No, uh, factoring is probably not in PHAB, yeah. 